Hi everybody, my name is Arkady Freckman and today I wanted to tell you how you can obtain $1 million in a car crash lawsuit. And we just did this, we settled a case last week for $1 million. And how did we do it? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the case. It was a lady who was crossing the street in the crosswalk. She was 62 years old and a car struck her. The car struck her pretty hard and the car was issued, the driver of the car was issued an oath summons for a violation. You're not supposed to hit a pedestrian in a crosswalk, right? So it was a really clear liability situation. And the car happened to have an insurance company and that insurance company had a $1 million policy. And the client in this case was a grandmother and she suffered a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury. She actually had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is a bleeding of the brain, and she had left-sided weakness. And because of the severity of the crash, as a pedestrian, she was knocked down, she hit her head, she had bleeding in the head, internal bleeding, and she had to be hospitalized for an entire week in November of, uh, of 2019. So she was hospitalized for an entire week. And then she was 62 years old. And so what we did was, you know, we, we knew that this was going to be potentially a long battle because there were going to be paper discovery, there were going to be depositions, and then we would have to put the case on the trial calendar and then maybe go to trial. So what we did was we sent what's known as a settlement opportunity letter. We sent a letter to the insurance company and we said, look, look at these injuries. They are horrific. This is a brain bleed. This is going to be life changing for this woman and her family. Just give us the million dollars. You have 30 days. And if you don't give it to us, then we'll go to trial. But the million dollars is not going to be what we're looking for anymore. Now we're going to be looking for like $10 million because, you know, this is so clear cut. And if you don't pay it, it's bad faith. And we are negotiating with you in good faith. So first of all, the insurance company, you know, they, they started writing us letters back saying, no, we're not going to pay that. Are you, you know, uh, first of all, they were saying ridiculous things like, oh, you're saying it's a brain injury. Well, maybe it's just going to go away. How do we know it's not just going to go away? Which is like, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about, but it just shows like some of these adjusters who are <laughs> deciding these cases are just like completely, I mean, they have no idea what's happening with medicine and they're, they're not up to date on uh, brain injury science because a brain injury like that does not just go away by itself but 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 anyway but um yeah this woman had a lot of different things she had um subarachnoid hemorrhages subdural hematomas subdural hemorrhages she had uh, a hemor hemorrhage along the anterior falcs which is like the center line of the brain a two millimeter hemorrhage she had a four millimeter subdural hemorrhage of the right front of convexity so she had, you know, a lot of serious uh, injuries and we only, we didn't only submit the medical evidence, right? Which is confirmed by like CAT scan and MRI, fMRI, diffuse tensor imaging, all these like neuroimaging studies. We had that, we had the hospital records, but we also submitted a little bit about her story. Like we got to know her, we spoke to her family, we found out that everything changed. She used to work in the garment industry and she was one of the managers and she managed like an entire company. And then all of a sudden she just disappeared. And everybody was like, all her coworkers like, where is she? Where is, you know, Miss Zinn? What happened to her? And she just basically could not return to work because of this brain injury. So she was forced to leave work. And then, and in the household, what she used to do was she would take care of her grandchildren. And she would be there because her her daughter and her and the daughter's husband would, would work. And so during the day, she would watch the grandchildren. But now she can't do that anymore because she would be, you know, just completely left completely debilitated. And she's a different person from who she was before. For example, she's cooking something and she turns on the gas. And then her daughter would walk in and say, Mom, are you cooking something? And she'd say, no, I'm not cooking anything. Why would you ask? She's like, the gas is on. And she's like, oh, really? The gas is on? And she wouldn't even know that she had turned the gas on. She would just forget because of the brain injury. And in the same vein, like sometimes the children would be playing in the front yard and she would be tasked with watching them, right? But they couldn't do that anymore because in the front yard in Brooklyn, their car is whizzing by. It's just a few steps from the road. And with a brain injury, she can't be the only adult watching these children because it's potentially dangerous, right? So everything changed, not just for her, but for the entire family. And that's why 
um, we, we correlated that. And I think that's very important for a lawyer to do, to clinically correlate those stories with the medical records. Because if you just say like subarachnoid hemorrhage, people wouldn't even know what that is. But if you explain, hey, it's a brain bleed and it's affecting the left side and now she's weak in the left side and now she has memory loss, short-term memory loss, then the stories like the gas being on, watching the children, they really become powerful. So we sent that letter and basically at first, like I said, they were no, we're not gonna pay. But the thing I like about these letters is it always gets them to do something, right? So in this case, the insurance company had what's known as in-house counsel. So that means that they had their you know, counsel that they usually put on all their cases. And then as soon as they got that letter, maybe a few weeks later, they were on high alert, right? They were like, oh no, something is up. Because we said, look, you gotta pay us a million dollars. If you don't, it's gonna be 10 million. So then they said, okay, we're gonna fire our in-house counsel. This is not a case for in-house counsel, but we're gonna hire a more reputable uh, outside third-party litigation firm that works with our insurance company as well as other insurance companies. And they have really top-notch trial lawyers. So they put in that firm and then that firm started investigating the case and that firm you know, started litigating the case instead of the, um, the in-house counsel. So that, that's the first thing that happened. And then a few months later, you know, we got a call. I don't know if it was, the, you have to check if it was the same adjuster or a different adjuster, but they just basically said, you know what? we're going to tender, we're going to give you the million. And at that point I spoke with the client. Actually, I, I didn't want to take it. I said, look, the deadline passed. I mean, it wasn't that much beyond the 30 days, but you know, I said, look, the deadline passed. If we go to court and we hit them for more than a million, we may have a strong bad faith claim, even though New York bad faith law isn't as good as other states that we have true bad faith. But I said, you know, we, we, we you know, we got to stick to our guns. But the client said, look, I mean, I really need the money. I don't want to wait. And this is like before we haven't even had any depositions yet, right? This is just starting. So because of that, the client said, let's take it. And we settled it. So we got the million dollars. So I thought this was, you know, a good example of one of the ways that a lawyer could fast track a case, you know, because what usually happens in cases, right? What usually happens is the adjuster calls you and says, what's your demand? You know, first of all, I don't like the word demand because it's like you're demanding, you're begging for money. Like, I, I don't like that word. I, I just like the word settlement opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in good faith. I'm representing a client. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm telling you, look, X is what it's worth. That's fair. That's just. That's civil justice in this case. Pay X. You don't want to pay X? Okay. Pay me a good faith offer less than X. I'll put the ball in your court. But see, the, the whole thing with demand is like, oh, I'm begging for, for, for something. I, I don't like it. But, but anyway, but, but what the point is, what they try to do is, what the, the insurance companies is, they, they, they tell you, counselor, you, you're the lawyer for the plaintiff. What's your demand? Give me your demand. Now, if you call them up and you say, okay, I have a brain injury. My demand is a million. Or some lawyers will be scared to even say that, right? They'll say, my demand is 950 because they don't want it. They, they think like they're doing them a favor, right? But as soon as you say that, there's no way you're getting 950. There's no way you're getting a million, right? Usually what they're gonna do is they're gonna offer you maybe like 200,000, 300,000, because as soon as you say 950, they whittle you down. There's something known as like the rule of three. They pretty much take your demand and they cut it in three and they think, oh, if you're asking for nine, that means you'll probably take three. And then they'll offer you like, you know, 150, why? Because they figure, oh, we'll offer him 150. Maybe we'll get him up to like two. We can park it at 250, 275. Maybe if we have to, we'll pay him three, 325. And that's their whole game, right? They want to whittle you down to nothing or to as low as possible because insurance companies just want to pay out as little money as possible, manage their risk. And, you know, you can never go back up. So once you say 950, you can never go to 975. And if you do, the, the, they'll scream and they'll holler and they'll tell the judge and they'll say, wait a minute, Mr. Freckman demanded 950 on January 17th of 2021. And now he's saying 960? No way. You know, the, their heads will explode. So that's why this, this is a better way to do it. Um, this is something known as, like, we use this method, uh, for, you know, it's, settlement opportunity letters, we put the ball in their court. We say, look, this is what's fair, you know, pay it. If you don't want to pay it, okay, fine. Then let's go to court. And in court, we're, why are we going to ask for the same thing? Like, we're just going to ask for way more. And it, it, it works. I mean, in New York, it doesn't work as well as, like I said, in other states, because other states have bad faith law, but it still works. So I think it's, it's a much better way to do things. 
And, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do another video when I, when I I'll get into all the nitty gritty about this case, the actual elements of bad faith that we cited in the letter. Um, I could talk about the liability, although it was very clear, like I said, she was hit in the crosswalk. I could talk more about the damages, some of the stories, some of the medical evidence. But I thought overall, this was a good result. And it happened fairly quickly, I believe, from the letter until the settlement, maybe it was like, I mean, it wasn't a month, it was definitely like a few months, maybe even closer to a year, because because they needed maybe some time to uh, review everything, and the client was still getting treatment, you know, still getting treatment, but um, I thought it was definitely quicker, because this case, like if we had not settled, if we said, Let, let's go, we'd have to do the deposition of the plaintiff, and she may have not been able to be deposed because of a brain injury, right, so someone else, like a family member, would have to be a guardian, do depositions, put it on the trial calendar, depositions of the defendant, put it on the trial calendar, motions like summary judgment, wait until the case would be called for trial. You're probably looking at, I don't know, 2023 on a good day, maybe 2024 until you would have a trial. And then essentially at trial, if you did hit for like 5 million or whatever, they probably just say, look, all we have is a million. That's the policy. There's no excess and just pay you the million. So in that sense, this was a good result for the client because she got the full million, it was done quickly, and um, you know we put pressure on them, and I think that's what lawyers have to do to win these cases. So I hope this has been helpful. Let us, let us know what questions you have. We're here for you, and have a great day. Okay, talk to you soon, bye-bye.